correct? All units, Snow Lake Napa unit. We have two major fires going in the unit. We're going to evacuate all the way from Calistoga to Santa Rosa. It was the most apocalyptic thing I'd ever seen. Never before in Sonoma County had we experienced a wind-driven fire that burned 11 miles in five hours. And one of our neighbors came banging on the door. The field next to our house was on fire. I'm going, okay, I'll just get the water, get the water hose or a fire extinguisher and we'll take care of this. But it was too, it was already too late. Okay, you could see the fire coming, starting to come across, across the trees and everything. The speed of the Tubbs fire was absolutely horrific. I would try to outflank the fire to get ahead of it into neighborhoods to try to evacuate people, but it seemed like within minutes, embers were falling and time's up and it's time to go. I'm Irva Hertz Pichotto. I'm the director of the UC Davis Environmental Health Sciences Center. Uh, and as I was watching the images of the wildfires in um, October of 2017, it just stunned me and it dawned on me that our center could actually uh, conduct some research and learn about these wildfires and contribute to understanding what the consequences of climate change are. So in California, we have a perfect storm of conditions which is making fire more widespread and more intense. Those conditions are human suppression of fire for decades, which means that the trees are more dense than before. Climate change, which is making these ecosystems hotter and drier, which kills the trees, makes them more flammable. And finally, the nail in the coffin, the pine beetle in California, which can come in and kill the trees. And this is why we have about 130 million dead trees in California now which makes them very vulnerable and susceptible to fire. The climate change is induced through greenhouse gas emissions from human activities, and that is causing ecosystems to become hotter and drier and more flammable. So climate change is contributing to the spread and the incidence of wildfire in many ecosystems on the planet. Now this is concerning for a number of reasons. It affects human health. It's hard to breathe the air when it's very smoky and we're seeing that happen in California and elsewhere. And then finally, it can give rise to what's called a positive feedback cycle. So this is a self-reinforcing effect in which climate dries out these ecosystems and kills the trees, fire becomes more prevalent, which releases the carbon back to the atmosphere as CO2, and that CO2 further contributes to additional climate warming. The changing climate is absolutely having an impact on how fires are burning, how they're spreading. California historically has experienced large devastating fires. What's really changing is the intensity of the fires, the duration of the fires, and certainly the frequency. The Tubbs fire, when it reached Santa Rosa, literally crossed the six lane 101 freeway. This tells us that we have to be looking at threats that we didn't necessarily consider before. I was the first battalion chief to arrive at the Tubbs fire. When I arrived, the fire was already very well established. We had no chance of putting it out. I got a phone call from one of my friends. It was probably around 10 o'clock at night. And she said, you know, I think there's a fire and it's coming towards you and I'm worried. So we started packing up. Once the power went out, that's when we left. We ended up getting gridlock. I thought maybe there was a roadblock or something. Uh, we turned back. And uh, the f I was just driving like a bat out of hell, and I was just thinking, we got to jump in the pool. It was almost like a blowtorch. Everything was incinerated. Power poles were across the road. Wires were hanging. Oak trees were across the road. Cars were burned out. On the way down, I ran into um, two Santa Rosa police officers that were making their way up Mark West. And I remember stopping them, concerned for their safety, and asking them where they were going. It was then that I met Officer Chance and Officer Nick with the Santa Rosa Police Department. And they told me that they were on the phone with two people that had survived the fire that needed to be rescued. We got in the pool and we hugged each other a couple times and we said our goodbyes. 
I can remember holding Max and he was panicking trying to jump out and I just had to yank him underneath. And I can remember a few times coming up for air, you know, barely, barely able to get a breath of air. You know, you're just in survival mode. A report of people trapped at 1404 Lorraine. I'd taken my siren and would chirp it a little bit in the spirit of if someone had survived, maybe they would hear the siren and emerge from whatever cover they were behind. I heard the a wail, a little wail of a, a siren. And I'm like, hon, I hear, I hear a siren. And damn if that thing didn't come around and come up here. Nick and Chance jumped out of their patrol cars and were able to find uh, the folks that they had been on the phone with um, and make the rescue. They put those folks into their car. And it was only a few seconds later that Chance uh, thought he heard something and realized that we had two additional uh, folks that had survived the fire and were huddled near a, a cement wall near their swimming pool. Given uh, what they had been through, I knew immediately that they had most certainly inhaled all sorts of toxic and uh, hot gases. They drove us and it was like a war zone. I mean, you were, you were driving it off the road a few times to get us down to the hospital. And the last thing I remember was Christina's in a gurney, I'm in a gurney, and the nurse takes Max and says, okay, we're gonna take Max to a vet and uh, we're gonna evacuate you. And that was it. That's the last thing I remember that night. We decided to launch an online survey to collect a lot of information uh, about people's experiences and also uh, we collected some ash samples, we collected um, air samples, and uh, we also uh, initiated a study to look at uh, women who were pregnant during the wildfires or shortly thereafter. With the data that we collected, uh, we're hoping to provide information that can be useful for nonprofits and uh, local and county uh, health agencies, uh, other agencies, um, to be better able to meet needs uh, in the future, and uh, really to continue to provide services for people who are still going through recovery. What was so striking about this particular fire was how much of that fuel for the fire now came from residential areas and all of the products that are in residential areas, anything from homes to consumer products to cars to the infrastructure. And so that's what really piqued the interest is what happens when you start to burn consumer products, anything as simple as cleaners or leaded paints or gas pipelines. Now all of this becomes a very large part of what is also in the fire from the biomass that we know about. The samples that we got from the Bay Area site have been brought back to the lab. We have started the chemical analysis, looking at uh, metals, and elemental carbon, and organic carbon, and we've also started some toxicity testing. So I can confirm that the emissions are strikingly different than your typical wildfire in an isolated wilderness area. They're different chemically, and there are things in the emissions that we don't even know what they are yet. We still have a lot to learn about uh, what the risks are from suburban and urban wildfires, uh, but I think we can expect there to be some very toxic and reactive chemicals that we will be breathing um, as a result of those fires. Tammy Scott is a patient I've known for about five to ten years. She was an outstanding roller derby player, I remember. And she had to stop roller derby because of her asthma, which was getting worse in the Sacramento area. She had a lot of environmental triggers to her asthma. We recommended that she look to move elsewhere. She made a decision to move to the Bay Area specifically because she knew that she was breathing better there. And I know she moved uh, onto a houseboat 
and uh, was doing terrific uh, up until the, the wildfires in 2017 from the Sonoma and Napa area, and that caused a significant worsening of her symptoms, and that's when she came back to see me. Before the fires, I, I had my life back. I could be active. I could do what I wanted to do. I was starting to skate. I was starting to work out a little bit. I did a lot of walking with my dogs, enjoying life, you know. And um, the air here is beautiful. There's usually a good breeze. Sometimes, like today, there's a real strong breeze, but it's fresh. Last October, when they had the wildfires, Sunday night I went to bed, but in the middle of the night I woke up because I couldn't breathe too well. On Monday morning I, I called in sick and the smoke was all around. By Thursday I'd called the doctor and I said, I need different medicine. I just, I can't breathe here. We had to increase her medications uh, to help her get through that. and. And while she's improved, she states that she, you know, has not recovered to the baseline um, before that exposure. I've had asthma all my life, so I've learned how to cope with it. But then when there's something environmental and you can't breathe, it's scary. I moved here to breathe and this has been my sanctuary. And suddenly my sanctuary was gone. After the terrible wildfires in Santa Rosa, we really wanted to figure out, be able to measure the air pollution from these kind of terrible disasters. But there was no power out there because, you know, when there's a big wildfire going on in a city, you don't, you turn, you turn the electric grid off. So we had no way of running our sampling equipment out there to measure the air pollution. And we weren't ready. And we didn't want to have that happen again, that we weren't ready. We were uh, thinking it would be really nice to get out there immediately and start sampling and get an idea of what these emissions look like chemically while the fire is going on. So Keith and I made a proposal to the Environmental Health Sciences Center here at UC Davis to develop a system, a portable battery powered system, so that the next time something like this happens, we'll be ready to measure the air pollution from it. So we have a red wire and we have a black wire. And the red wire is the hot positive current voltage. If they were touching each other or metal and we hooked this up, there'd be sparks. We don't want, we don't want sparks. Now there's the sparks flying. Create our own wildfire, we create our own emergency. We don't have to go anywhere right here. Oh, we'd be ready. <laughs> no trailer needed. We just... <laughs> so we're gonna get a trailer. We're gonna put both of these two things on the trailer and then take a truck and take it to wherever this air pollution situation is happening, and then use them as power sources. You know, I started off in air pollution because I was living in Los Angeles and it was terrible there, and it was something that I could feel could really help society. <sighs> okay, so let's review the wiring to make sure we don't blow anything up. And then this guy goes to the red. And everything should work. Sweet. Now we plug in via this extension cord, our sampler. Flip the power. And uh, we are collecting air pollution. So we can actually run this, we tested it. We can actually run this for 18 hours on just one car. This is all very good and I can go check out, see what kind of current it's drawing. Zero. Is it really? Something's wrong. Power's not there, current's not there, but the voltage is there. Yep, something is wrong. <laughs> and this is the fun stuff. When you actually get to come out and you do the real work and you do the hands-on, you put it together, you turn it on and it works, that's gratifying. That's it works the second time, not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> After you make the mistake the yeah. first time. If it works on the second time, that's amazing. Okay, let's give it attempt number two. Inverter off, car off. Sweet. 600, 700 watts. All right. <laughs> when we got to the Tubbs fire, 
it was clear right away that this fire wasn't going to be um, contained quickly. It was like a raging monster. We pulled into this neighborhood, a lot of chaos. There were cars fleeing. I see this woman standing outside her car with uh, her phone to her ear in a panic. I tell her, you know, ma'am, it's time to go, you gotta go. And she says, um, my mom and dad, my mom and dad. I said, okay, um, you know, what's the address? And she told me the address. And uh, I said, I'll go up there and, and take a look. And um, I said, but you, you really gotta go. We have fire on both sides of the road. There's trees that are basically just torching off right next to us. We're running over power poles, trees that are down in the roadway. We're pushing at, at all costs here to get to these two people that are unaccounted for. I look off to the side and the heat's so intense that my mirror on the fire engine is starting to melt. And I'm watching it um, start to warp and um, I had to call it that we couldn't get back there. And that was really tough. And as we come around the corner, we see this man on the side of the road. As our commando, where's your, where's your wife? And he just looked at me and he shook his head. And this man is burned pretty well to the top of his head and his hands. And um, he's now my, my main concern. So when he gets into the engine, um, the two guys in the back seat start caring for him. And he said, uh, I just lost my best friend. We loved each other since we were kids. And everything, all the emotions throughout that whole night are starting to really compound on our crew. And he is telling us how he held his wife till her last breath in a swimming pool. Because that's the place that he thought would be safe. He said, I have to live. I remember when he said, I have to live. I thought, uh, I was thinking just, yep, you, you know, you have to live, you're right. But he had to live, he had to live because he needed to see his daughter, his granddaughter. That's why he had to live. There is a culture that needs to change in the fire service. I grew up in a culture that uh, said, suck it up, son. You'll be all right. It's very important with what we're seeing and what we're dealing with to uh, reach out and to, um, to say, hey, it's, it's okay. It's okay to talk about it. PTSD is one of the most common types of mental illness following disasters. It's been estimated that among people who are direct victims of a disaster, 30 to 40 percent of them will go on to experience PTSD. Uh, about 20, 10 to 20 percent of rescue workers and 5 to 10 percent of people among the general population. To this day, I keep going, well, there must have been something else I could have done. All I could do was just sit there and watch it. But all I could see was the house just going up and the winds just kept carrying it right on over. And now when I hear a lot of howling winds, I still I start having memories of that night. 
the PTSD is, um, it hits you, or it hits me, at just the oddest times when I had my collapse in, uh, in said January and February. Uh, I couldn't complete a sentence. I would start a sentence and I'd kind of wander off halfway through and forget what I was saying. Uh, I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't sleep, and it was really a, really a mess. And even with counseling and stuff, it took a while before it got better. Some of the experiences that people are reporting to us still today um, are uh, physical things like uh, headaches, stomach aches, people aren't sleeping, they're exhausted physically, emotionally people are feeling sad, um, anxious, uh, and there's growing anger as the process takes longer than expected. More and more we're seeing people are feeling isolation and that's one that we really watch um, and really try to do a lot of outreach and help people connect because isolation can turn into depression. Uh, and so a lot of the work that we're doing in this program is helping people connect to those that they really feel truly support them because connection is the most protective factor around uh, traumatic outcomes. One of the largest challenges for the survivors is feeling like the world moves on and gets back to normal when your whole life is in upheaval and is going to be for such a long time. You know, I go drive past the lot now where the house was. Now that they've cleared everything away and you go and you just look at it and you go, Everything's gone. I mean, it's, and it's not coming back. And even if we build something else, it's not going to be the home that we had. And our life is never going to be exactly the same as it was. One of the most important determinants of mental health following disasters is what kind of response there is to the disaster. So, for example, investing in shelter, investing in food, electricity, um, hel helping a community stay together and work together, those kinds of interventions will really be predictive of long-term mental health. En dos horas nos cambió completamente la vida. A mí y a casi 10,000 personas en esta ciudad. Después de los incendios, lo más difícil ha sido buscar una estabilidad eh, para vivir por las altas uh, costos en la renta. Cuando llegué a ver ahí la casa, fue muy triste para nosotros llegar a ver todo eso. Ver nuestras ilusiones quemadas, nuestros sueños, una vida de sacrificios, completamente hecha cenizas. In the 2017 fires, the Spanish-speaking population in Sonoma County was disproportionately harmed by not only the fire, but by the response to the fire. We like to say the fire was an equal opportunity harm, but the recuperation, the recovery, and the support was much worse for the Spanish-speaking residents of this county. Before the fires, there was a 1% vacancy rate. We lost 5% of our housing stock in Santa Rosa. So if you do the math, it's really clear that renters are out. Yo fui a aplicar algunos apartamentos de bajos ingresos, pero las listas de los bajos ingresos son muy largas. 
He buscado un apartamento también, pero el más barato que encontré fue de $2,300. En Coffee Park pagaba $1,700 dólares. Y apenas me alcanzaba el dinero. Entonces decidimos quedarnos aquí. Y, y, y esperando que la señora, de la dueña de la casa, nos dijo que ella va a reconstruir y, va, y que nos tenía considerados para volvernos a rentar. Yo he preguntado a mis hijas qué quieren hacer, a dónde quieren regresar después de donde estamos. Y la única respuesta que me dan ellas es a Coffee Park. Entonces es uno de los retos que creo como familia vamos a enfrentar y que esperamos y que se puedan lograr. No sé cómo, pero tenemos que lograrlo. ¿Te acuerdas de aquí, Nala? Our point is term generational justice, you know, it's the same as like social justice, environmental justice, but you know, we have responsibility to hand off what we inherited it, at least as good a shape as we got it. So I, you know, I look at our kids and I think about what they're going to be faced with and all of the, uh, the fallout that's going to come with climate change and rising sea and, you know, that's my motivation.